So what did you expect when you went onto the show? Man, so I'd never seen a reality show in my life. Like, never. Yeah. Uh, I like scripted television. And then I didn't watch a ton of TV then. So uh, I used to read books. It's weird. Uh, they got boring for me. But anyway, uh, so <laughs> the guy said, that's like the real world, but with fighters. And the producers thought that too. They didn't know what they were getting into. Like the, the PAs and the camera crew, they didn't know what they were getting into. And the first thing that, that I thought maybe we were off to a bad start is when we got to the house and we looked at the food, it was like Diet Cokes, Pop-Tarts. It was like the same food that they put in the real world houses. Right. And I was like, um, we're, we're half weeks here, man. We, we can't eat this crap. We, like, I'm 235 pounds. I was 233 pounds the day I showed up. I was like, um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta, you gotta, just gotta help me out, man. This ain't gonna work. Not gonna make 205. Yeah, man. anytime soon. So what happened? They, they figured it out. 61 yeah. days, we all figured it out. How would you describe what life was like in the Ultimate Fighter house the first season? Man, I don't know. It's like anything. You look back and it seems like kind of an awesome experience because of the way things turned out. But if things turned out differently, I'd have probably been like, what a waste of my time. But I made some good friends. Uh, I enjoyed meeting those people. And I've always thought this, man. People that get into the sport. Like, I noticed this talking to Quentin Jackson one day on The Ultimate Fighter. Um, we had relatively similar backgrounds. Same stories about our families. Uh, you know, we're even athletes. You become relatively similar. You know, you think about athletics as kind of a, something that unites a lot of people from different backgrounds different beliefs and 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 i think that one thing to have in common with somebody sometimes outweighs all your differences right april 9th 2005 yeah what happened uh yeah me and stefan put on a pretty decent fight sure and did. and the the biggest aspect of that uh was you know maybe it was like kind of a tipping point too just that whole fight the show the culmination of the show but the biggest thing is there was like a, a napkin deal done in the back to, to to do a season two of the ultimate fighter mm -hmm. spike and the ufc guys were kind of uh you know they were uh well i mean you i watched the 20 for 25 on it It was pretty great um and uh you know it was right it was kind of right there you know we're close to being profitable we don't know what's the you know and then uh and after that they were like we should do this when did that happen it happened like right after the franklin fight so like during the fight, like that night, yeah, like that night, yeah. And were you a part of that, or did you? Just no, 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 no. I just, I, no, no. I just, it's the the many the, yeah. the many lures. I just watched the video. But That's your experience about. of that night was what? It was amazing. Man. We went back to the Hard Rock. I had some of my best friends in the world out here with me, just because we were all UFC fans. That's what you have to understand. It's like we all wanted to be here we wanted to be around you know people and and i got to do interviews at seven in the morning with ken shamrock all week you know and, and he was like you're a pretty big guy yeah you're gonna make two or five <laughs> and he's like yeah i think so um so but that yeah. night what sticks out from that night when you think back well, on i mean that just night. like when it, when that fight was over i was like hey you know what my job now is to be a professional fighter I don't have to be a cop. I don't have to bounce. I don't have to work security for Goody Mob anymore. I am a professional fighter. And how did and that feel? I can put, it was felt great. Cause you're like, hey, now I can put all my energy into being really good at fighting. And then, uh, you know, we were gonna go out drinking and stuff. And I just like, man, I didn't need alcohol right now. I'm just yeah. so, so high on life, bro. You know, I just want to, I just was like, oh, let's do something. Let's do anything. Let's do it. Yeah. So now you're a name. You're Forrest Griffin. Yeah. You're a UFC fighter. Yeah. Yes and no, but I was you, eh, 2005, you know, yeah. there wasn't a lot of people. As you go on as a UFC fighter now, what was like, what, how is it different? I mean, you know, I got up at 10 a.m., practice at noon, practice again in the evening, you know, lift weights, do you know, it was really cool. Like, I like a routine like that for the most part. Yeah. So it was fun. I got to travel around a little bit, go to different camps, work with different people. Um, I got to work with guys at AKA. I got to work with some different gyms in Atlanta. So you can cross train a little bit. That was cool. You're building up to 2008 when you fight Rampage for the title. 
So what do you remember about getting the title fight in anticipation of that? I don't I don't How know. big of a deal was it? Yeah, yeah. I mean it's I mean I can't understate it for me, you know, in, in life, not a big deal. Uh, but but for me at that time that was a culmination like that's what I wanted that's what I set out to do when I was 20 and I found the sport that's your ultimate dream and it's something I never even said when I was sober like I want to be champion I was like eh, I want to do this I want to make more than I would as a cop save a little money and then go back get back into law enforcement and be like Andy Griffin the sheriff of a small town I, I, had, I had my exit strategy planned out yeah I want to be like sheriff of a little podunk town in Georgia, you know? If it was that big of a deal professionally, why do you say in life not a big deal? Oh, because, I mean, just, you know, your, your children, your, your health, your parents, you know? Um, just for me, for my personal selfishness, and that's the cool thing about fighting, um, for me anyway, and for a lot of people I think it can be, uh, it's the ultimate expression of you. It's you time. It's your thing. It's you. It's a sport of one. It is a great thing. It is, uh, it is inherent to be selfish. You know, we we saw some of uh, the Karate Hottie in her documentary having a hard time accepting that she has to be selfish. She has a husband and a, and a daughter, and she's. I have to be selfish though. And like, you know, you, you, it's human nature for a lot of good people is like, well, I don't want to be the selfish. But, yeah, you have to be if you really want to achieve stuff. And how did you manage that? Oh, I'm just selfish. I'm just selfish. I don't have a lot of other people in my life, either. Like, I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, you remember watching me walk around. Did you ever see me with a big posse, like with a bunch of people? Nah, because you got to be responsible for them. I would show up to open workouts and have to hit on other with other people's guys because I wouldn't even bring my own because I was like, well, i got to pay them for the day if I bring them. I don't know, Pam just to sit in the truck with me all day and hit minutes for 10 minutes. Just leave him home. So your personality helped in that regard? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just not... Um, it's easier to be selfish if you're just straight up and down about it and never make promises or have people hanging on, you know? I don't want people to want something from me, you know? I pay my trainers at the end of every week. You won't find anybody that says I didn't pay them. I didn't pay them well, but I paid them. I paid him promptly. Yeah. So you win the title. What was life like as a UFC champion? It was stressful. Why? Because you're a champ, man. Everybody's gunning for you. You know? A um, guy like John Jones sees it. He's just a beautiful competitor to watch because he sees it as just an opportunity to always get better, to be challenged. I saw it as something, you know, it's like the, the biblical story about the 10 talents, you know. You give the guys 10 talents. I want to bury mine and keep it safe. You know, John Jones wants to invest his and make it bigger and make it grow. So, you yeah. know. So the stress of the anticipation of a fight from when you were a kid kind of creeps back Ooh, in. So much, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but you know, hey, man, money uh, notoriety, all that stuff takes the initial fun, purity of a thing out of a thing. And all of a sudden, it's not Fight Club anymore. Uh, this is, this is you know, a sport that, you know, people are watching, people know who I am, I owe it to my mother, because she's what, you know, it becomes a deal, right? Yeah. If you let it, and you have to embrace that. And I didn't figure out how to embrace that and how to have fun with it until it was done. But I'm sure that's what a lot of people say, right? Yeah. So now... As somebody who's been there, done that, you worked your way up. BTDT. <laughs> yeah. You became everybody, a champion. everybody in this building's got, like, you know, RD, MSC. Uh -huh, right, right. You know, DPT. Right. BTDT. So you've like been that. there, yeah. done that. BTDT. Yeah. You Stick achieved your MS professional right? dream of, of becoming a fighter in the yeah. UFC, yeah. then a champion. And now you hear it time and time again, all these guys, I want to be champion, I'm going to do what it takes to be the best. What would you tell those fighters? The ones who haven't achieved it yet, but want to, and that's all they talk about. I mean, I would say, good, keep it up. If that's, that's your laser focus, beautiful. I mean, if anything, Bisbing's the story for that, right? Like, I, I'll be honest, after the Tim Kennedy fight, fight I thought, Bisbing's not the same. He beat everybody on conditioning and transitions since his eye. He, he did not condition like he was, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought he was probably going to be done. Boom. Little did we know. And that's why, that's why this is the best sport there is. 
You know, he's about the human story, right? You want to connect with somebody. You want to connect with Tiger Woods. Sorry, I can't connect with Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, to me, is, is a one in a million anomaly. Whereas Michael Bisping, he was a carpenter, a, a DJ. He was a bouncer, you know, myself, bouncer, a cop. But, you know, we're, we're more like every man. You know, even John Jones failed at collegiate wrestling. Wasn't great. Got beaten by Matt Riddle. You know, it, John uh, Cormier uh, didn't make weight in the Olympics. One of the worst moments in U.S. Olympic wrestling history, right? Uh, came back from that to become champ champ, to defend both belts, to, you know, it's crazy, right? It is. It's, 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 this is the sport where there's more on the line and it's more individual and it's more about that person than any other sport, right? Uh, again, I, I was an early adapter, right? I saw this and I thought, well, I like basketball and football. And I still watch some playoffs. I also watch some, some, you know, whatever, some hockey. Yeah, I mean, nothing compares to the, to the realness of MMA. The old tagline for the UFC was as real as it gets. And I always liked that because it's really true. And, you know, you're, you're playing a sport. You're putting a ball through a hoop where we are dominated another person in the most complete form of competition ever created designed to be as safe as it can possibly be in front of a lot of other people oh yeah and that like fear of, fear of public speaking like i still have it you know i had to meet some kids this morning i was nervous like oh boy, what am i gonna say december 2008 you fight rashad evans with the belt on the line that's right what was the difference of fighting as the challenger to fighting as the champion uh i don't know that there was a huge difference you know, I mean, again, that, that belt, you know, and it's funny. I was so weird. I was like, yeah, I just want to defend it one time and then I'll be good. And then, uh, yeah, that didn't work out for me. Compare winning the title to losing the title. Uh, it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, why do you say that? I don't know. It just didn't affect me. Like I can tell you, I went out and had fun at that after I party. I don't know. It was almost like, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. That's been lifted. And that's why guys like Pierre and Jones and and uh, Silva, you're like, man, to wear it and want to wear it takes somebody special. And you know what? I could have been a little different. I could have played my cards different. It's kind of what I started the interview with. I'm a negative Nancy. I'm a, oh, God, I got to do so much work, you know. I, I could have uh, definitely I would have changed my mental game looking back. In what way? This is a good thing. This is an opportunity. You get an opportunity to prove yourself. You know, look, look, look forward, not, you know, don't, don't invest your, your, your talents wisely. Don't, you know, grasp them to you, squeeze them as hard as you can with your fingers. I don't want to lose this, you know, and that's how you lose things, right? You just squeeze and it comes through your fingers. And that's, you know, that, that's kind of what, what, uh, what I always did, you know. But after that fight, you wake up and you, was that, what, was there a sense of what? No, I mean... I, relief? No, not really relief, but like, yeah. You know, I figured, yeah, I can get better. You know, I still have the optimism. I'll get better. Yeah. I'll work. I'll try to change a few things up. I can get back there. It was before, you know, this is back when, you know, Shogun and Quentin and Rashad and Machida and, and all guys that I thought I could... I got a chance for those guys, all of them. Machida would have been a tough one, but any of those guys, I'd fight those guys, feel good about it, you know? Um, but then, you know, like guys like Jones starts coming along, and you're like, whew, glad I got out what I did. <laughs> How would you describe your UFC career in general? <sighs> well, you know, the best way, I had a lot of luck. I've always been lucky. In life, and you know, luck is when you're an opportunity or whatever, all that, or the residue of whatever. No, I have had good luck and bad luck. <laughs> luck, it turns out, can be impartial. And, uh, you know, I had really unlucky breaks as well, and then really lucky breaks. So that's what, that's, that's what I think of when I think of my career as man. Things went amazingly well for me on some nights. And then, man, everything was just against me on some nights. That's the thing about luck. I think it was actually Peter Dinklage was saying something about it, the, you know, Game of Thrones actor. Um, you know, this is not, this is not luck. This is just the result of, like, doing it again and again. You know, I got unlucky as much or more than I got lucky. But I got lucky. What was your luckiest break? 
Joe Silva saying, hey, I saw this Forrest Griffin guy at a local show years ago. You should put him on the Ultimate Fighter. Right? Yeah. Tough to top that. No. Uh, because some meant nice to track it all back. Otherwise, I'm teaching defensive tactics right now. Close court combat, gun retention, edge weapon. In Georgia. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I've gone national by now. That stuff's become really popular. I'm actually flying down to work with the Border Patrol guys for a couple of days. Oh, wow. What was the unluckiest break? Uh, man, you know, you get sick right before a fight. Got, got knocked out before the Anderson fight. Knocked out cold two weeks before. And, uh, you know, just was never right. Wasn't sleeping, yada, yada. So don't, don't get knocked out. And this is back before there were 40 events. Mm -hmm. And it was as kind of easy to pull out of a fight if you didn't have to, have to. Right. How would you describe your trilogy with Tito Ortiz? Man, you know, it's still uh, all that done, 45 minutes, and I don't feel like, I feel like it was a bad movie that just ends without a satisfying, you know. How some, come? Uh, somebody should have knocked somebody out, tapped somebody out. It's just 45 minutes of grinding on each other, you know. It's just like one of those, like, really good indie films that you're like, oh, this is pretty good, this is pretty good. And then when it comes time for the finale, it's just like, and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 how that's that went. But no, I don't want to rematch. He, he's he's in pretty good shape. He looks pretty good. But your last one was ultimately your last I know, fight. No, his retirement fight. I know. So you got to give him that, which, I mean, unfortunately. The, uh, a lot of the sport is about... You know, like a Cormier and Tito. You can, how long can you do it at this level? Not just can you do it at this level, but how long can you stay here, have these big fights, and do this? Because it, it's a toll on your body. It's a toll on everything. It's hard. There's always somebody new coming to shoot the old vet off, you know? How long did you expect to go? Oh, man, I thought I had another six fights, realistically. Yeah. Yeah. What changed that? Blew my knee out, ACL, MCL, meniscus, and then eight months later, I blew my meniscus again. And then, so I already have no right shoulder to speak of, and so I was like a lot of kicking, a lot of leg work. I'm on a, you know, I'm actually pretty, or I used to have, I played basketball, so I actually pretty decent footwork, and I'm like, I'm going to adopt this Dominic Cruz, Michael Bisbing type footwork style, and I blew my knee out, and I'm like, nope, that is it. No knee, no shoulder, no good. I want you to subscribe. 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 Hey, I'm not joking about that subscribe, okay?